Hello, everyone. I'm Salim Barahme, Director of PIPD. I want to welcome you to another episode of Dardashe, a series where we talk at length with amazing and inspiring Palestinians about their lives and the work that they do. Today, we're joined by Susan Abul Hawa, a novelist, activist, and poet, and author of the best selling novel, Mornings in Janine. Susan, how are you? How are you holding up in these crazy times? Um, I'm, I'm good. I mean, you know, uh, relatively speaking, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm grateful, you know, I, it's not like I told you earlier, it's not a huge departure from my normal life. Cause I, you know, I typically live in isolation anyway, so it's me and my dogs <laughs> and I <laughs> work from home and I write from home. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it is, um, it's it's rough seeing what's happening in the world and and mm. nobody really lives in isolation really so it's it's, um, it's heartbreaking to see what's yeah. what's happening surrounding pandemic, yeah. um yeah it is it is and it's also i think highlighting how some of the most vulnerable are being affected by this disproportionately um absolutely yeah like everything else right exactly exactly yeah. just another way to highlight it um, I wanted to start kind of, you know, with, with your early days, where you grew up, what were your earliest memories? Um, yeah, so take, take us back. Well, I, I mean, I, I was born in Kuwait. Um, my parents were um, refugees from the 67 war. From there, uh, I was kind of, um, uh, I came to the U.S. Uh, when I was 13. Um, I mean, I came initially as a, as a toddler, but, that I, but I went back very early um, and uh, went to primary school in, in Kuwait. Um, so some of my earliest memories are, are there. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I, I've, I've been in the States since I was 13. Um, mm -hmm. From Kuwait, I actually first went to, I lived in Jerusalem for, uh, from the time I was 10 till I was 13, actually. So from, so I came from uh, Jerusalem, actually, to the States, not from Kuwait. Is that where your parents are from? Is that where your family's from? from yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, and they obviously had to leave in 67? Yeah. What was, I mean, did, have, did they share that experience with you growing up? Were there stories around what it was like? Yeah interesting because they they never really wanted to talk about it um i did press my dad at one point um uh, and he said well you know what do you want to know they came they were shooting they said get out and we just you know we had to leave <laughs> that was you know, yeah. they just you know they had guns and they told us to go this way and we had to go that way um one of my um aunts um <clears throat> actually uh who was kind of shoved along in the big crowd that you know went that crossed into Jordan mm -hmm. in 67, um, uh, went back on foot. She, mm -hmm. she had her, uh, she just had, she grabbed up, she grabbed her kids. They were all young. She had four kids, um, three boys and a girl. And uh, they made the trek back to Atur on the Mount of Olives um, by foot and um, hitching a ride wherever she could here and there. And, and it, was a, it was actually kind of a, a very perilous track back um but she did go back and so she and her kids ended up you know um getting absorbed into um you know the, those with the jerusalem ids mm -hmm. and so when i when i lived in jerusalem um i i lived in an orphanage in dar Tafid, but um you know i was back and forth to her house um so and i still had you know family on my dad's side as well which is actually really the same side because my parents are cousins <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, my family actually had a very similar experience. I, so my, my family's from Jericho and they fled to Jordan in 67 as well. Mm -hmm. And so my grandfather decided to take his kids. I don't think my, my father was born then. And, um, uh, and he left back to Jericho while his brothers and sisters stayed. So mm -hmm. half the family or the majority of the family stayed in Jordan has never been back. To this day, yeah, yeah. refugees and, and uh, the same yeah. thing with um, I mean I you know I have aunts who who never went back. Um, they're in Kuwait and they've stayed in Kuwait and they've never been back. I mean they just have early memories of of being in Palestine and um, uh, yeah it's it's a sad and and terrible fate that um, you know this exile. I mean I think a lot of a lot of times people 
Um, I think that those of us who live outside of Palestine have it um, have it easier. And in some ways we certainly do. I mean, you know, we don't live under the constant threat of, uh, of, of closures and seizures and bombings and whatnot. Um, but that there is a, a, a spiritual and cultural um, deprivation and familial deprivation that um, that's, that's just a condition of exile. Mm. Um, yeah. Do you, do you, do you feel, do you find the, the struggle within exile is, is shaped entirely differently? That is often a disconnect between Palestinians who live in Palestine and those who live outside. Yeah, I mean, for sure. So, um, you know, one of the, one of the ways that the Zionist agenda has succeeded um, has really been um, in fragmenting Palestinians, mm -hmm. fragmenting our society. Um, and, you know, they, they did this initially geographically, um, but it has succeeded um, in many other ways. It has succeeded um, psychologically and linguistically and culturally. Um, and yet, um, and yet we all still kind of defy that agenda in many ways. And so we are, we, are, we do remain unified. And I, and our unity um, rests on the fact that we all kind of exist in this common anguish, this common wound, you know, um, that has been festering since 47, 48, um, and was, has been amplified, you know, uh, with every new massacre, every new seizure, every new attack. So um, we do remain, we do still exist in this landscape of, mm -hmm. of a wound, um, and it's very real. But for mm -hmm. us internally as Palestinians, you know, there's often this kind of measure of um, the degree of one's Palestinianness. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's damaging to us. I mean, it's something very human and, and it's bound to happen. I think, I think all societies of struggle experience mm -hmm. um, something similar. Um, uh, and, and oftentimes, and sometimes it's based on, you know, colorism or class or economic status and whatnot. Um, but um, in our case, there, I think one of the most damaging aspects of the divisions is the, the linguistic um, division, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, language and, you know, being a writer, um, I'm, I'm very sensitive to, to the, the power of language and the importance of language. Um, uh, not only as, as a mechanism of expression, but as a gateway um, and a window to each other and, 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 and as an access point. Um, and so when you grow up um, in exile, that's one of the first things that gets pilfered. Um, it's like, you know, exile is a thief in that way. You know, mm -hmm. it, steals, it steals language. So, you know, I speak Arabic. Um, I read and write it. Um, but I can't write in a way that's sophisticated enough to, to you know, to write my own novels in Arabic. Mm -hmm. so that's, I mean, that's actually one of my great... Um, uh, Regret's not the right word because I didn't really have an option. Um, Frustration. Frustrations or, or uh, even wounds, you know, mm -hmm. um, bothers me hugely that yeah. I, I can't write my own novels in Arabic myself. Yeah, that's a, a lot of a lot of Palestinians. I lived abroad for, for 10 years and in the U.S. and the U.K. and other places. And, and that was always a measure of one's Palestinians. I think the, the way you spoke Arabic... Um, and your ability yeah. to communicate in certain ways. Yeah. Uh, and that would be a litmus test for how Palestinian you were. I wanted to ask uh, with, with, with all of that, you know, did you find that the, the, the trauma prevented a lot of the times some of the older generations who experienced um, exile firsthand from being able to communicate and speak about it to the younger generations? For sure, yeah. And not just the trauma, but I think the shame of it. There, mm. there was a shame in, you know, because I think a lot of them felt that, um, you know, they ran away. Uh, and, and so there's this, a sense of guilt that, 
nobody, they didn't know, you know, people run away from danger. I mean, you never expect that. I mean, the idea that you could lose your country and never be able to go back is, is, um, is so far from, from the imagination that like, how does, how does a land get pulled out from under your feet? What do you mean? Like these Europeans are going to come and take the country. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nobody could have, could have conceived of this. Nobody understood what the Zionist agenda really was. Um, even those who, who did sort of, um, you know, some of, some of the intellectuals who did see it coming, um, never, even, even they could not imagine um, that it would be this complete sort of colonial, um, settler colonial project that could actually displace an entire indigenous society. So, um, so there was a little, I think there was some guilt. And um, so for example, it wasn't until many years later, by the way, uh, my grandmother and my, um, on my, uh, my maternal grandmother, they uh, were from Riha. From, oh. uh, yeah. And, and, my it was years later that I found out that my grandfather was actually imprisoned by the British in a water well in Jericho. Wow. Um, that's yeah. And, uh, um, uh, just during the mandate, um, and they, they could, they could, they, my grandmother and, and my mother and my aunt that, um, uh, my oldest aunt was, uh, they used to go and just sort of drop, take, take, um, water and food to him and just drop it into the water well when he was in prison there. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the stories, um, I really only was able to collect as an adult later because I just kept, you know, um, I continue to try and, and preserve as much as I can of my own history, but yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, to be honest, I, I find those stories coming out of my grandfather now you know, um, the older he gets. And I think there was a time when we were growing up where we didn't hear these stories at all. Yeah. And we were, you know, we are in, we are in Jericho. Um, so what, what was it like going to Jerusalem after all that time when you were a child? And, and why were you in an orphanage? You don't um, yeah, no, my parents were living, both of them. Um, so do you know Dar Tafel? That was yeah, created by Sipendel Husseini. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I ended up living there. I mean, it was... It was um, <clears throat> my parents divorced very or when I was very young. And so it was one of those things where, you know, the oldest kid kind of got lost in the shuffle and went from one place to another. And my grandmother finally, you know, she, she knew Satint and, um, uh, and she took me to, to, uh, Palestine. Um, it was actually, that's a story in itself. It was like, I, she basically snuck me in, um, when I was 10 years old. So this was in, this was, this would have been 1980. And of course, they didn't have the same kind of um, surveillance and, and whatnot. And I don't know if you remember, if you, you might not be old enough to remember what the Jisad was like in those days. But basically, I mean, my memory of it was you kind of walked in, um, there was this huge open area, like the sprawling space where soldiers were stationed at all these tables. And they just, you, you put all, you opened up all your suitcases and they were going through everything. And there were these stations of people, you know, um, just with their, stuff opened up and and then they uh, all the women would have to go into this room and disrobe um you know down to your underwear and they would take your shoes away to examine run your shoes through an x-ray and it was a, it was a really humiliating process but you know I was a kid and i just had these snippet you know images mm -hmm. of 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 that time and i didn't even realize that i was being snuck in uh, but I remember my grandmother telling me um, she she th there was a family that had a lot of kids. There was a family of women with like you know ton of kids, mm -hmm. and she said she told me um, stay stay with them, um, just you know act like you're one of them, and I'll meet you on the other side. And she said you know just keep reciting the Fatha and and uh, and tell me what other surahs you know in the Quran and. And I told her, and she was like, Shatra, you know, just keep saying them in your head. Don't look any soldiers in the eye. Just stay with the kids. And I was a runt, you know. Um, I was, like, always the shortest person. I still am. Um, and so, you know, I just, like, I did what she said. Um, and I stayed with this family. Um, and I, I just kept repeating every surah I know in my head, like my grandmother said. And then, um, and then eventually I walked through, and my grandmother 
just, uh, she grabbed me and, you know, basically said, you did good, Chakra, you know? <laughs> uh, so it was only in retrospect that I realized that, you know, she, she probably paid those women, had made a deal with them to, to get me through somehow. Um, uh, I mean, you couldn't do anything like that now, but it was a little, it was a lot more chaotic back then. And, and also, you know, uh, the country was a lot more open. Mm. Um, so like, you know, Jerusalem wasn't closed off. We could go from, from Jerusalem to, uh, to, to Jericho, to, mm. to the Allenby bridge. I mean, we could go to the beach even, um, those things weren't closed off the way that they are now, but in any event, so, um, you know, I stayed at that at the fell <clears throat> until I was 13. Um, and it's funny, I I always thought that um, I, I eventually left and I came to the States where m my father lived here and my uncle. Um, I always thought that my dad sent for me, but, um, and, and he did, but, he, but it turned out actually that um, I uh, was kind of found out not to have uh, Tasriyah or, you know, a, a Jerusalem ID. And so being 13, um, I... I was considered an illegal. So I was basically, you know, removed mm. um, wow. as an illegal. How, how I, I, there's a, there's a part of me that viscerally connects with that. So I, I went to school in Jerusalem uh -huh. and I needed a tasrih to go, but yeah. my tasrih was from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then yeah. I went to Jerusalem. And so, but it, but they, they built the wall and, and the Kalendia, and it wasn't easy to come and go anymore, like it used yeah. to be. Yeah, night. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so my my entire uh, teenage years, my formative years, were spent trying to stay away from Israeli soldiers, potentially asking me to show yeah. papers so I don't get caught, and then get my distracted vote to to go to school, and it's the only school I've ever known. So. Mm. That, that is one of the, like, it's, it's trauma that I still think have from, from growing up during those times. Yeah. Yeah. So I re actually, I remember one time, um, sorry, my, my dog just realized that I'm not paying attention to <laughs> somebody else. So he has to, <laughs> this is Luca. Hi Luca. That's my sweet boy. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, I remember, I mean, I was, so I was in, I was at the orphanage, I was at Dar al um, just shortly before the second, I mean, the first Intifada started. But, you know, what people don't realize is that even, like, well before the Intifada um, was officially an Intifada, there was always stuff happening. I mean, there, you know, there were always resistance activities, there's always um, closures and, and um, the drab, you know, strikes and, and, um, and I, and uh, abuses too. So I remember um, one of one time when uh, school was letting us, you know, the, the, the orphanage was letting us um, go, you know, go home or leave or whatever. And, I, and my cousins came to get me to take me to my aunt's house. And we were stopped by a group of soldiers. Um, and uh, I mean, there's a bus that went right, you know, from, from the old city into uh, Tur. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were stopped heading back. My cousins were, probably were maybe just young teenagers, like 14, 15. They're not, they weren't that much older than me. And um, they made, they were kind of laughing and um, they made my cousins, they told them they had to sit across from each other um, and spit in each other's mouths. Um, and they, they weren't allowed, they, we weren't allowed to leave until they did that until they, they, they managed to like, they would spit and they, and if they, we couldn't, they, like they didn't, they didn't get a pass until they, until the spit landed in the other's mouth. Um, it was a horrible scene. And of course I was terrified and I actually, I peed myself, mm. um, and, uh, and finally they, you know, my cousins like, you know, were, were trying not to cry. Um, mm -hmm. I think they were humiliated, you know, by me watching too. Um, <clears throat> and to this day, like we're all adults. Right. And they, and I tried to bring it up and they just wouldn't, they, they wouldn't even, I mean, they're so humiliated just by that, you know, they were still humiliated. They wouldn't even talk about it. So they were just basically spit, spitting on each other's faces and trying to just, 
trying to make it happen so they could, so we could all move. And then they're spitting and crying and, and, uh, and the soldiers were laughing, you know? Um, but this was like the daily shit that happened. Um, uh, you know, you, you're just, you know, you're there for their pleasure. You're there for their target training. You're there for, to, to serve them. And that was, that was always the sense that you got. And they would, you know, the school, um, and of course I didn't understand a lot of things when I was younger. Like I didn't know the politics. I didn't know the history. I just knew that sometimes soldiers would come into our school because the older girls were refusing to go to class you know, but it was a strike. It was general strikes and the older girls were politically active and they would refuse to go, um, go into class. Um, and then soldiers would come in and, you know, beat some people up or take some people away or threaten school and whatnot. Um, and you don't understand any of that, but, but all that stuff is in your head. And then it's like, it's only years later, you sort of start to make sense of it. Um, there was like a time I remember too, um, in Jerusalem, the, the same cousins, the same guys, um, mm-hmm. took me to uh, a pool. It was a public pool. Um, it was supposed to be mixed, right? And um, and I, most, you know, Arab girls didn't wear bathing suits and, and whatnot. But um, so, but I did. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and so these girls were playing with me um, until they realized that I was an Arab. I think they thought I was Jewish um, and they just started, uh, they splashed me out of the pool and just, you know, were taunted me and, and I left in tears, you know, so that stuff happened all the time. Like um, we, we, you know, we didn't mix, we never really mixed with them, but I just, that was one of the times that I remember um, my cousins, you know, wanting to do something nice for me, you know, um, took me to a pool and, And they couldn't do anything too. They were also humiliated by the fact that they couldn't like defend me or anything. Yeah, this is, this is, it's, it's, there's, there's a, there's obviously the oppression, but then there's this really uh, deep layer of humiliation that, Mm -hmm. that that they impose. Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah. Especially of men, like there's this emasculation of men Mm -hmm. that, um, that's really profound. And, you know, um, it, it translates into all kinds of like domestic dysfunctions too. And um, that, so, so it just, it, it starts to dismantle our society in, in, in some profound ways. And that, you know, because when you have people who are constantly humiliated, constantly threatened, living in anxiety from the time you're a child, like, you know, you just, and I think it's intentional. And, you know, we've heard these soldiers say that, you know, you have to get them while they're young to make them afraid of you. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's, that seems to be a policy. Um, it, it feeds into, I think, toxic masculinity in a, in a very dangerous way. And yeah. I would, you know, growing up in Jericho, you know, my, I was around for the first intifada, but, but mainly the second intifada, those were, you know, I would see that. I would see how that would play out with a lot of my friends from Jericho, from from a lot of the people around me, and and it was it was ugly a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but at the it, same time, there's a lot of you know, um, there's extraordinary resilience too, yeah, um, yeah. And, and a really um, a profoundly optimistic uh, and defiant way of being too that. You know, I mean, it's it's a miracle that our society isn't completely broken. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Um, no. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's 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 yeah, it's incredible um, to say the least. And so, after your time in Jerusalem, you went to the U.S. Um, how was it like being a teenager in the U.S. after experiencing that? I'm sure it wasn't easy. Oh my God. <laughs> So, oh my God, it was so traumatic, <laughs> especially because, I mean, it was, it was sh- culture shock on steroids. Mm. Um, first of all, you know, that it defeated was an all girls school. And even though I came here at 13, I was still very innocent. Right. Mm. And I remember like being shocked that all these eighth grade girls were carrying pocketbooks. Like to me, I remember that, like, I was like, pocketbooks are for ladies, for women, you know, for mamas and aunties, like I'm these 13 and they were wearing makeup and I was like, Oh my God, you know? Um, so, uh, 
um, so there was that, first of all. And um, I also, um, even though um, English was, uh, was part of the curriculum at Dar al um, and and I could speak it a little, you know, better than most people, I was not really very literate um, mm -hmm. in English. So I had this big secret, too, that I couldn't really read or write English like, like the other eighth graders could. Um, so adding the culture shock together with the shame of not being able to really read um, or write very well, um, I also had like a extremely dysfunctional family life, you know, just w um, living with my dad and, um, and initially stepmother. So um, it was hugely traumatic for me. Um, and the, I remember the way that I taught myself to read and write was um, – uh, I just used to, because it was in Charlotte, North Carolina, I used to copy the entire front page of the Charlotte Observer newspaper. I had no wow. idea what I was copying. I had no idea. But there was, but I just would, I just kept writing. Like I would just copy every single word um, in part because like, I remember it made me feel good to like pretend I knew how to read and write. So I was just constantly writing and writing. Um, and, um, and, but at some point, like, you know, the, the human mind is so um, malleable and extraordinary. Mm. At some point, like, it started to make sense. And and I started to, you know, realize, understand, like, what the words meant, put together. Um, and, uh, yes, that's how I learned to read and write English, was doing that. And 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 I'll tell you something else, too. To this day... I have this um, really weird habit of constantly doodling, constantly writing words. Like, and it's, and it was, it, I think it's from that time. It was just this nervous kind of anxious copying every word of the, of the Charlotte Observer. And so now if I'm on the phone with somebody or whatever, I am like writing down or if I'm listening to, to a lecture online or whatever, I'm like writing down words from that come into my ears. And it's just, it's this irrepressible habit. <laughs> it's funny how habits form, you know, um, when, when you, when you were speaking, something struck me, how did something that used to give you so much anxiety and so much fear turn out to be the thing you do in your life? You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> how, how did you how did you how what was that journey from from you know 14 15 year old susan to uh you know susan now the writer or how did that happen good question so um i mean the short answer is really i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um but uh so i i actually went to school um for science i was in i went to med i was in a phd program um uh, uh, in biomedical science and neuroscience. And, um, and then for years, um, I, uh, worked, uh, as a researcher for a drug company. Mm. Um, and, um, it was the second intifada really when I started writing, um, started as letters to the editor and it was mostly out of, you know, frustration, um, because, um, you know, just, just, you know, you know how the media is, right? Like yeah. they don't really, they don't tell the truth. <laughs> like it wasn't yeah. what, what I was seeing in the media wasn't like anything that I, I knew to be factual, um, of what was happening on the ground. So I started writing letters to the editor and that kind of graduated to op-eds, um, and then like personal essays and reflections. And, and to my surprise, um, you know, they were getting published. I mean, the internet was still kind of young. Um, and, and a lot of online independent media had not, you know, fully materialized yet, but it was doing so at that time. So um, there was that um, uh, conversion of, of, of events. And, and I was surprised that editors were asking me to write more. So um, that was sort of my first inkling that, that I even knew how to write, that I could write something effective. So you didn't start with fiction. You started with... Political commentary, Political yeah. Commentary, yeah. Yeah. And so when, um, and activism. And so mm -hmm. when there was, um, 
uh, uh, when the massacre in Janine happened, what I was reading on uh, in our you know listservs of activists on the ground was very different than what was being reported. So I just decided to go there because mm-hmm. I just I just decided okay this is where I need to be. My daughter was quite young at the time, and um, I asked her dad to you know to to take care of her for you know a couple of weeks. I took my entire two week vacation from work. And I just went there. I really had no idea where I was going to stay, what I was going to do. I just mm-hmm. went and, and you know, you know how Palestinian society is like, if you need a place to stay, you're going to find a place to stay and yep. you're going to make new friends and you're going to have, you're going to, you're going to be okay. And, and that's exactly what happened. Um, and I was able to, um, uh, I linked up with this wonderful family and these amazing people, um, one of whom was helped me sneak into uh, the camp the day before it opened. And so, um, you know, what I witnessed there was, uh, was really, was, was extraordinary and, um, and really life-changing. Um, it's one thing to, you know, read about atrocities and an entire, entirely different matter to kind of experience it with your senses with you know your smell and and smell was a big one (laughs) um and and to just you know be with people who who experienced it directly um and to to feel um to feel what they went through by Mm -hmm. you know by speaking to them when i returned to the u.s the, the the juxtaposition of those of those images and that reality from Janine, um, mm. together with my reality as a you know a scientist working for you know this corporation, basically big pharma company, um, was just was really jarring. Um, and by that point, I had already really angered a lot of people, a lot of the um, bosses where I worked. I unknown, un- I didn't really realize it, but um, and nine eleven happened, so. Um, all of those things sort of uh, uh, put me in a really vulnerable position and I ended up getting laid off. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so without really, you know, with a so single mom without really any, any savings and, and uh, no income, um, I, you know, after I cried for a whole day, <laughs> I, um, I just kind of sat down and started writing about, mm-hmm. you know, Janine and, um, pretty soon, um, I realized, you know, that I wasn't just writing an essay or personal reflections or whatnot, that um, I decided it was a novel and, and I just kept writing. I, I borrowed money. I mortgaged my house. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, I went into massive debt, actually. Um, but they were like, my daughter said, my daughter tells me that they were like the best years because I was home. I didn't have to rush to work. She didn't have to go to daycare. Um, you know, I was waiting for her on the bus and I, and so I got to be more involved in her life. She was in elementary school. Um, and it turned out that, you know, getting laid off, (laughs) it was like the best thing that could happen to me, but it was a long journey to get it published and all that. But that's, that's how, yeah wow that's incredible I, I wanted to ask you and if you don't mind sharing um the experience i know things like that can be traumatic the what it was like to walk into janine for the first time after the massacre because i don't think a lot of people remember that it happened i don't think people even even within palestinian the younger generations within palestine here i don't think they have yeah. quite the memory of of the second intifada Mm-hmm. And I, I think it, it's, it'd be good to kind of yeah. remind people some of some of the things that took place that were horrific. There's really nothing I can say that can adequately describe the um, how horrendous it was, to be honest. Um, and this is just the aftermath, mind mm-hmm. you. I wasn't there when when the terror was happening, so. I arrived in, in the rubble and the aftermath and, um, in those scenes in my book, um, I mean the, the, the massacre of Janine features in my first book mornings in Janine. Um, and, uh, so I tried to describe it there, but one of, there were two like 
major sensory items. Um, first was the smell. Um, a lot of people were were buried um, under the rubble. There were mm-hmm. people. So there were, there were rotting corpses um, that you couldn't. You, you just had to. We had to dig for. Um, and I was personally involved in um, uh, uh, um, excavating um, three bodies. Uh, one belonged to a young man, and the only thing left of him was um, uh, uh, like his spine. You know, we were digging, and they were, and people were taking care to you know pull out as much as um, as much intact as possible. But it was being excavated um, in like. Um, uh, and like where, where, where the digging was happening, like there was a threat that if you dug the wrong way, this other structure was going to fall on all of us. So there was that. Mm. Um, and there were two other bodies. One was of a, um, an older gentleman with, uh, I guess it turned out to be his granddaughter or grandson. It was a, it was a child. Also, there was this other thing that there was this haze of, um, of dust that just would not settle. It was like, it was like at, you know, at, at, your, at the level of your nose and eyes, just this constant haze, you know, that this dirt and dust that just would not settle. And it was there for days. Um, there was this little boy um, who, uh, so we, we stayed um, at the house of, of um, this dentist um, who had lived in Janine. And his house, he lived in an apartment building, and it was partly, like, completely destroyed right so like what used to be his living room was like a half a room it was about mm-hmm. it was a balcony you walked into and then there was the open space yeah. but some parts of the apartment were still intact and we kind of all stayed there and slept on the ground and this um and because he's a doctor you know people were he's a dentist but like the word doctor everybody was kind of bringing their sick there there was a there was a doctor from iceland named sven um he was there too and he was there as an activist, not as part of any kind of uh, contingency. And um, this little boy came, his mother brought him, he, had, he was having a severe asthma attack. Um, and Sven uh, 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 tried to help him. And, and it, you know, in talking to the mother, um, it turned out there was, uh, the boy had, um, he had a nebulizer. Um, but their house, his father um, had been, uh, run over by a bulldozer um, and they were they couldn't get to I can't remember the story exactly but um, she, some people went back with her to try and see if they could retrieve the nebulizer and on the way she found her um, husband's shoe his um, nalo that he was wearing Mm-hmm. Um, and she just kind of broke down, um, right there. And, uh, anyway, so there were just things like that. And then, you know, we had hours and hours of videotape of people just kind of wanting to document the immediate aftermath. Um, and, it, it, uh, people don't realize that there were no journalists allowed. They completely locked down the entire, nobody was allowed in. And yeah. it was just, that was, yeah, that was, that was uh, even after, so I was there after they opened it up technically, right? Mm-hmm. But even then there really, there really weren't people like, um, I mean, I was there for two weeks and I barely saw anybody, but the, suddenly, but there, every once in a while you, you would see like a trickle of somebody here or there, right? Like mm-hmm. what clearly Westerners, um, but for the most part, there really there was no UN investigation team. We saw nobody. Like we were filming these people, thinking that this this footage would be used in some kind of um, war crimes tribunal or something. Nobody ever asked for it. And all the people who wrote the um, the the report the, the, um, that exonerated Israel, none of them had been there. None of them mm-hmm. spoke to any of the the witnesses that we spoke to. Um. Yeah, and, and and there's another story that really stands out in my mind. <laughs> um, there was uh, uh, the, like one section of of Janine of the camp was is was completely decimated and bulldozed. That was the you know the, some parts of the camp were hit worse than others, mm-hmm. and in that part there was just rubble as far as you could see, and occasionally you know pe- families just kind of digging with buckets, like bucket by bucket, trying to pull out whatever was 
whatever was there where their house used to be. And I looked up um, and I saw this uh, elderly couple, Hajj, 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 Adin. Sorry, they were just drinking some tea on, on these rocks. And I guess their granddaughter or something, you know, brought them some tea. And it was such a, um, visually, it just, it, it struck me um, like something so normal and, and communal against the backdrop of this extraordinary terror and, and despair. Um, and I asked them if I could take a photo. Um, you know, it was like, it's one of these things like, okay, um, something really voyeuristic and intrusive about that. And at the same time, like, I just, I wanted the world to see this. Um, yeah. I wanted to have, I wanted to document that, that particular image. And, uh, so I thought, you know, maybe I'll just, I'll ask their permission and see if it's okay. And, um, and they just said, you know, <laughs> which translates yeah, yeah, yeah. screw it like, just comes back to tea <laughs> yeah 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 they're basically and they like basically they just said just come drink tea just you know, mm. you know so they they asked uh, uh, their granddaughter you know bring another cup and she brought another little glass of, of tea they I don't know where they you know where that came from but you know I sat and we had tea Mm -hmm. um, they were from the Abul Heja family, which is uh, which was the family that yeah. um, ended up featuring in my novel. Um, and uh, uh, so there was there were those those moments of ex extraordinary resiliency against the backdrop of um, just un unbelievable destruction and despair and terror and. Um, there was also a moment to like, people didn't have water, uh, right? They did like, literally people were just, um, uh, they had nothing but, you know, the shirt on their back. And oh, here's another story. So we were, so some of them were, uh, I think it might've been the Y or some kind of like building or something where we were all kind of sitting. And um, I, and this young man um, that we were talking to interviewing, I, um, uh, I asked him, you know, just to, to have a seat and, and he didn't want to. Um, and, uh, and then he later, he said, he's like, well, you know, this is all I have. Um, I don't want to get it dirty, but mm -hmm. he was so meticulously dressed, right? It was, his clothes were so clean. They were, they had been ironed, you know, or something, <laughs> you know, so there's this dignity too. And then, you know, and he doesn't, he's afraid. He didn't want to sit down. He would just rather stand because he didn't want to get his clothes dirty. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and so, uh, so back to what I was saying before about, you know, there wasn't water. The camp didn't have water and people were having trouble, you know, getting water. Um, uh, and there was this delivery from U.S. aid of water and tents. And all the men and the women uh, stood by the road to block the entrance, the, in the entrance of, of the aid. They're like, really motherfuckers, this is what you, you know, you're going to do this to us and you want to bring us water. You know, we don't want your water mm -hmm. like that. It was just, you know, I mean, they needed it. People needed to drink, but they like, there's just this dignity and this pride. And, um, yeah. so, you know, all of that stuff, like I had, I, you know, I had all of that stuff in my head and nowhere to go with it when I came back. And, uh, and I found myself at one point in the cafeteria at work, um, all these people from work. Um, I was just, you know, trying to be by myself and read a book um, at lunch. And some people came and sat around me and they were just kind of miserable because the company had decided that they weren't like going to issue any stock options that year or something like it was going to affect people's bonuses. And these were people who made a lot of money already. And, and I just remember thinking, oh my God, I just, I know I this, I'm in the wrong place in my life, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. How, yeah. I mean, how was it sharing that, those experiences from Janine and what is, I mean, an apol unapologetically Palestinian story and narrative in the form of mornings in Janine? In a, in a post 9-11 world, in a, in, a, in a society where discourse on Palestine is extremely dehumanizing. 
What was the reaction? I know it was, it's a best-selling novel, but um, there, there must have been also kind of a negative pushback at some point. Um, well, first of all, nobody wanted to publish it. I couldn't find a publisher mm-hmm. in the U.S. Um, yeah. And some of them even said, like I, one of the, I remember this one editor who said this, this um, book is beautiful. It's, it, the language is, um, uh, the language is really great, blah, blah, blah. We love it, but it's a hot potato. That's how he said it. This is a hot potato. Um, so um, I had to, um, and I eventually found this really small press that, um, and it was, it was published under a different title. Um, it, was, it was The Scar of David initially. And um, the, that, um, unbeknownst to me, they were actually going out of business and the book was kind of dead on arrival, like the day it was printed, just a small mm-hmm. amount, and it never got any distribution. But one of the things that happened in the interim was that um, a publisher in France and um, uh, Boucher Chastel and then also uh, a publisher in Italy had read the book and they wanted to translate it. And, mm-hmm. and it did well there. So um, through, through my um, uh, publisher, Marc Perrant, in, um, in France, uh, I was introduced to an agent um, in, uh, in Barcelona who, who took who took my book and sold it to Bloomsbury and, and that's how it was later published as mornings in Janine. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so what kind of, what was the reaction when, when it was published again in English and it, it became, it reached many more people and it was, it was out there in, in, in the two thousands, which I'm sure wasn't an easy time to, to yeah, hear. So, so it was published in 2010. Um, and uh, um, and it, and it, it was translated into, um, uh, eventually into like 30 some languages, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but it really, uh, so it it didn't get a lot of marketing. It was mostly Mm -hmm. word of mouth. Um, and I think it, it became kind of this, um, uh, like a, a landmark, novel in that it was one of the first kind of ep- like epic kind of multi-generational uh novels about you know that spanned some of the major events in Palestinian history that was mm-hmm. in the English language and so I think that there was clearly a, a need or a desire or for for some kind of narrative like that mm-hmm. um so it filled a gap and I think it was um you know, it just, it came at the right time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and it, and it became, um, a bestseller, but, uh, also a long seller. So like typically the life cycle of a book is, you know, bell shaped curve. It goes up, you know, after it's published, it has a lot of readership and then it gradually kind of declines. Um, but mornings in Janine just kind of went up and then it plateaued and it's still, and it still sells. I mean, it's still going. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, my second book kind of followed the more traditional, you know, bell shape up and down kind of uh, curve when it comes to sales. <laughs> but um, yeah, Mornings in Janine was kind of special, and 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 again, it's almost it's it's readers do that, you know. Um, it's almost I almost feel separate from it now, to be honest. Yeah, like I wrote it, but at the same time, I think the characters kind of. It's like it grows up in the world and it does its own thing. And I think readers kind of readers give it that life. They give it that um, whatever is special about it. Um, so yeah, it's out there doing its thing. And, um, uh, but it was a long road to, you know, from the Genesis and, and it really all started in Janine. That's where that, um, that's where that story started. Yeah, I what, a, what a journey. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about um, is I saw in, a, in an interview you did, you spoke a bit, and I think you wrote an article um, making the parallels between the Palestinian struggle and the Black struggle, African American struggle, and I think it was situated around, I think, Amal coming to the US and finding an affinity for. I think that culture more so than, than other cultures that made her feel like an outsider. Was that something you experienced as well mm-hmm. in, your, in your life? And is it, I think a lot of people don't understand the, the, the similarities we see as Palestinians in, in those struggles in the U.S. Can you talk yeah. a bit more about that? 
Yeah. Um, so um, my own experience in general has, has, uh, has really followed along those lines. Like I, um, I, I always like from the, you know, when I came here, uh, I always felt a greater acceptance in African-American communities of like with friends and, um, and, and the families. And, uh, you know, whenever I, um, like, I hate to, I don't like making these generalizations, but, you know, with, with white families, um, I was always kind of, I always felt like the token, like, oh, and even, even like as an adult, you know, I've literally been to the homes of friends and I'm, I'm introduced as this is our Palestinian friend, you know, like, I mean, can you imagine somebody saying this is our black friend, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not just a friend, I'm the Palestinian friend. So, so that, that always felt like more pronounced, um, as a child. And I, I was always sort of feeling like I really needed to behave well and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and represent and whatnot. Um, uh, which I didn't feel, uh, in, in communities of color. So, so there's that. There's also, you know, um, Arabs who come to this country, like a lot of immigrants, um, sort of aspire to to whiteness, right? Because they aspire to to power, and 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 whiteness is power, and whiteness is defined by anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's a simplistic way to put it. Um, so that so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of racism in our community, and um, uh, it's 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 alienating sometimes to me like i you know um and and it's really sort of helped me kind of come to the understanding that you know the people we think are our community aren't you know we think our people are the ones who who speak like who, who speak our language or who, who look like us and whatnot um but i think you know, our people really are, uh, um, you find your people based on shared values and shared, um, so that, like, that's on an individual level. And, but on a, on a greater level, um, I think that's, that's true for, or should be true for us as a society. And this is something that I've talked about or tried to, you know, I've tried to lecture about in the past. And it is, it's, it has to do with the Euro, the Eurocentric nature of our discourse. Mm -hmm. um, when people talk about, I remember actually I was in Gaza and talking about this, giving a lecture. And I said, you know, when, when, when we talk about the world, um, what we're saying is we're talking about the West, right? Because we're not, we're not talking about Africans, African mm -hmm. nations. We're not talking about South Americans. We're not talking about, um, you know, Southeast Asians. We're actually, when we say, you know, the world won't hear us and whatnot, we're talking about Europe and we're talking about the United States. And, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, <clears throat> and I remember, uh, and, and, you know, I pointed out in that lecture that, you know, in fact, um, uh, uh, the masses in Africa and, and governments um, of African nations and South American nations have actually always stood with us and they've always been in solidarity with us. We can't really say the world, right? We mm -hmm. always, we're always speaking to Europe, but we don't direct our conversation to, to our friends, right? Why are we always kind of, you know, saying, yeah. hey, look at us. We're people like you. We're always, we always have something to prove, you know, we're just like you. Um, as opposed to just um, just speaking to our friends and the people we know who are our friends. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, on a societal level, I think that's, that's a problem with us. And as a community level, on the community level in, in the United States, I think you see that same kind of um, replication. We're always trying to integrate into this white power structure, right? And, um, and, and ignoring the... Um, ignoring people of color who are, who are uh, facing the same struggles that we are, but we don't want to identify with them, you know. Do you see um, younger generations of Palestinian Americans and Arab Americans becoming more progressive and understanding the way they fit within, I think, the, the, the landscape of America and, and power structures? 
Yeah, I do. I do. And, and you, and you look at um, like Rashida Tlaib, for example, I yeah. mean, she, uh, um, she, in her district, she, you know, one of the things that got her elected is her, her um, uh, activism and working specifically in communities of color and, um, and, you know, she grew up in that milieu and she does bring that level of awareness and camaraderie uh, and um, solidarity with other oppressed communities. And so she does that. She, she brings that and mainstreams it in Arab American communities. So, so yes, I mean, I think that's, um, you know, in addition to this kind of, uh, uh, landmark this this you know historic moment of a Palestinian <clears throat> um, congresswoman. Um, there's also you know the effect that she has in our community and in really um, making mainstream Arab American communities better, more mm -hmm. um, more socially aware and responsible. Um, so yeah, so I do I do think this younger generations um, are shifting uh, shifting general attitudes and um, and and I and I don't think it's just in our community. I think I think you see it happening in other communities of color. Um, mm -hmm. It's happening among among Latinx um, communities, among Asian communities, especially Asian American communities. Now we're like, hey, wait a minute, you know, we're not that model minority that we thought we were. Mm -hmm. um, so you see a lot of Asian American activists kind of really um, uh, working towards greater solidarity with African American uh, um, uh, African Americans in this country and and. Uh, just sort of coalescing our individual struggles um, and understanding that um, we we belong together, you know, and in a, in, a, in a larger a larger community um, that is marked by solidarity and and having each other's backs, really. Absolutely. One of one of the things that. I lived in the U.S. for five years, and and um, I saw the growth of of um, BDS as a first as a form of activism within the Palestinian Arab community, um, and the Palestinian American community, and the Arab American community, and how that was a, a form of of being tied and connected to Palestine there. Um, but there's still a lot of misconceptions and misinformation about BDS, and I, I think you're a vocal supporter. Of, of BDS, course. yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I wanted, I wanted maybe to get a sense of what BDS means to you, um, and why you think you know cultural and academic boycotts are, are very powerful. Uh, uh, and and I think trying to understand and explain to people who might not really understand what it is. Yeah. So um, uh, I am. Yes, I, I'm a signatory to the um, the academic and cultural boycott. I think um, I think that's uh, it, it's a hugely powerful um, aspect of of the boycott, but it's also um, the hardest sell too because there's still this argument of you know art art. Uh, should be separate from politics and whatnot. It, it's just, it's the same kind of absurd argument that sports are separate from politics and whatnot, you know. It's, um, uh, but, and, you know, one of the reasons there's, there's so much um, confusion about BDS is because there's a deliberate campaign of confusion. Mm -hmm. of conflating really any kind of resistance against Israel as anti-Semitism. And, um, and I, and um, so, and, and what does BDS mean to me? So, you know, BDS is a, is, is a way to internationalize um, a, a popular struggle for liberation. You know, we have a lot of friends around the world. Um, there's uh, uh, I think, most people around the world are um, uh, operate w their lives with a conscience um, and a sense of justice. And I think that when they realize what Israel has been doing to us um, and, and what our struggle is about, I think 
um, it's a no brainer for people what side they need to be on. Um, and BDS gives them a way to be on that side. Mm -hmm. um, it gives them something that they can actively um, and passively be a part of. No, I, I think it's important to point out because there is an, an attack and the conflation of BDS with, I think, the fight against anti-Semitism and there's usually defamation campaigns. And as you said, there's more fair, but there's also now legislation in different countries and a lot of American states that uh, essentially criminalize Palestinian advocacy by targeting BDS. And yeah. I think it's, 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 it's important to deconstruct a lot of the myths and misconceptions that have been developing around it. You know, one, I think a lot of people don't understand that it's the three, the three goals of BDS is ending the occupation, equality yeah. for Palestinians of 48 citizens of Israel, and also justice for, for and return for refugees. And, and All those, things that, that comport with international law and, and human decency, basically. Precisely, precisely. And it's not an attack on the Jewishness of, of a state. It's an attack on a state, its, its injustice and its policies and, of, and, and the oppression. One thing I, I've heard a lot, because we travel and, and we do advocacy for Palestine in Europe and sometimes in the U.S., is, and I think you touched on it a bit, but I, I would love for you to kind of... Um, unpack it a bit more, is, is this academic and cultural boycott. It's, it, people don't seem to make that argument um, or understand that argument fully um, mm. of why we need to be boycotting academic institutions or academics or certain cultural events. You know, why, why shouldn't singers go to Tel Aviv and perform, for instance? And that's something important to at least understand, right? Because there's a lot of misinformation uh, and misconceptions around that. Yeah. So, um, right. Um, it, it, for the same reason that um, artists didn't go, didn't play in Sun City, right? Um, it's why there's this mass uh, cultural boycott of apartheid South Africa, because um, when you, when you perform in a place um, that's marked by, uh, oppression, genocide, apartheid, or, um, uh, or, or anything of the sort, you are lending your name, you're endorsing it. It's not just, you know, um, art, uh, but it, you know, what you do, what you put your name to has implications. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this has been such a wonderful conversation and so enriching. And it's, Amazing to, to hear about your life, your journey, and, and the things you've experienced. So thank you for sharing them. Well, thank you. This was fun. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for everything you're doing. I mean, this is, uh, this is wonderful, you know, just speaking to Palestinians um, everywhere. And, and it allows us to connect, too, like to build yeah. our community. This is really nice. Thank for you. For sure. For sure. Are you, are you going to try to do the literature festival uh, at some point this year? Well, um, uh, if we, yes, we, we're going to do it. And, 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 uh, um, at some point, uh, it's probably not going to be 2020 because, okay. um, uh, but it's going to happen. We, but we haven't made any decisions yet exactly when, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're just like everybody else. We're just trying to see how this is going to unfold. But what well, seems very clear is that it's not going to go away this summer. Um, yeah. And there very well may be another wave in the fall. So um, that's why 2020 isn't, isn't really realistic, but yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. It's, it sounded like yeah. a, a great, amazing thing. Yeah, so, yeah. We, uh, we, so we definitely have to have you guys. Um, we'd, yeah. Yeah. We'd, love to, we'd love to make it. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Take care and uh, um, hope you stay well and safe and healthy. Likewise. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.